Hi everyone, I'm here with uh, Dan Colcott today, who's from the Digital DRA, and uh, and we're going to have a bit of a catch up. So, Dan, how are things? Good to see you. Good to see you too, Chris. Um, I think, yeah, things are going going well. We're busy, so I don't think we can. There's, there's many complaints from our end. Have you, have you found the market since we last spoke? It must have been it was probably over a year ago now. I know you guys have been growing, and we we were coming off the back of the pandemic last time in terms of like digitalization was a big theme and those kind of things. Have you seen much change or? Um, yeah, so obviously we launched pretty much as we were coming out of the pandemic. Um, and obviously back then, digital were, were a hot topic. Everyone trans- doing the transformation into digital. Um, I think I think now I think that the hottest topic is the, the, the vulnerability side of things. Obviously, we're seeing a lot more people in vulnerable situations that probably necessarily wouldn't have been given everything that's going on, cost of living, energy inflation all, all that kind of stuff so yeah i think our shift has focused to now using the tech and the digital journeys and how to better help vulnerable customers and so are you noticing that vulnerability is changing or has changed over the last year in terms of the types of people you've seen coming through yeah so i think i can't i can't speak for everyone but i think we're finding more people that that have never interacted with a debt collection agency before and I think that's something that, that that's important to navigate. So yeah, th- there's definitely a lot more people that, that are struggling than they usually would have been. And it's for circumstances beyond their control as well, um, which makes it a little bit a little bit more difficult because people it's a little bit unfair. <laughs> people yeah. think it's unfair, um, which it probably is. There's lots of different pressures on consumers at the moment because you've got, I suppose you've got cost of living increases like food prices go, have gone up so yeah. substantially. And I suppose you've got energy costs that have gone up. And the other thing in the background, we've had recent um, interest rate increases as well. Just looking at a graph on that, it's quite dramatic how that's increased even over the last six months. Which of those are the ones that, that sort of stand out? Do you get different flavours of trends that are coming? Without up? a doubt, it's energy. Yeah. Energy, I think that's the one that's hit people the most because that's the most dramatic increase over the shortest period of time. Yeah. And then I think what I'm seeing a little bit more on now is the mortgages. Yeah. And you see a little more of that in the news as well. So I think that's going to be the next hard hitting thing. Yeah, and I suppose energy, energy over the summer might moderate a little bit just because yeah. the weather improves, right? I've had my heating off already. I'm sure people will be doing that because that will save a little bit. People yeah, definitely. Reduce payments because, you know, over the winter it was, it was quite high, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And what about income? And I suppose that's the thing we always talk about is, you know, expenses have been going up. And if you've got an income, then you're covering it. But are you seeing people as more people coming through have lost their income? Or that's something that doesn't really seem to have come through, at least in the news? No, I'd probably say no. I don't think I don't think we have seen an increase in people contacting us to alter hmm. the payment arrangement that they previously agreed, which is fine we've done recently done a few updates on us customer portal to allow people to self-serve that as well so they don't have to speak to us to do it but yeah there's definitely an increase there but in terms of, of people losing their income completely um i wouldn't i wouldn't see there's a no, noticeable increase or spike in that mm. what we've seen anyway i know you've had a big focus on digital are you still finding the digital approaches are still the same same success rates that they have been or is that kind of changing a little bit because it feels like there's a big push around digital but it feels like that's been moderating a little bit maybe a little bit more of a maturity around it yeah so i think i think for us obviously we're we're 99 digital anyway all our customer journeys are digital um but i think one of the one of the key things I try to get across here is that that just because we're digital, it doesn't mean that that you can't speak to anyone. Or we've lost that complete human touch. Mm. Having the digital self serve journeys is fine, but then the ability to transfer and speak to an agent in the resolution mm. team makes that 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 journey a little bit more seamless. So if there is yeah. a point where a customer gets stuck, they can transfer and and straight through to an agent where it's web chat whatsapp whatever that looks like to the customer it there's still people there available to speak to we're not just saying there you go do it yourself the digital element is just by digital means it's not 
completely self-serve. Yeah. And I suppose what about from clients? Clients probably a year or so ago were probably much more demanding around, we've got to have digital journeys and that's a big sort of opportunity to put digital journeys in. Is that sort of changing now as, with the vulnerability piece? It's, you've got to do both as well as just doing digital. You've got to do both because we're hearing the vulnerability is a bit of a hot topic. Yeah, so I think for us, I don't think we've got any plans to move to, because we do have the calling capability. So if we do identify someone that we need to speak to, we can. It's not like that channel is completely closed off. Mm. But as in integrating that into our overall strategies, that's not in the in any of the plans, short term at least. I think what we've done, we focus more on utilising external sources of data. Mm. So we've recently launched a partnership with the Vulnerability Registration Service, for example. We've got multiple APIs that are scanning the customers at the point of load mm. so we can recognize if they're in debt respite scheme before we've contacted them we can recognize if they're insolvent before we've contacted them we know if they've got a known vulnerability before we contact them mm. and we can tailor strategies to that rather than so that's how we're kind of expanding our digital vulnerable customer journey so digital strategies seem to be a little bit a blended interaction with customers now are you seeing that any changes around people's interaction no and i'm a firm believer that if you are vulnerable and there's something going on mm. in your life that you don't necessarily want to talk to it's a lot easier to do it over a digital a digital channel it's easier to send a whatsapp saying i'm struggling with this than yeah. try to explain to someone on the phone i know personally me i wouldn't tell someone on the phone so i'm a firm believer in that the digital channels the di- digital chat tools open that door a little bit more for obviously the, there's exceptions to the rule but i'm a firm believer that overall it opens that door a little bit wider for customers and how do you find that true as well in terms of vulnerability as well the fact that people can be ashamed to talk to an agent particularly if they're in debt does it open the door to actually getting better insights into vulnerability i think so i think so obviously i can't speak for everyone but from my experience and what we see definitely because the, in terms of the amount, the percentage of people that say, I'll only speak on the phone and want to speak on the phone, I've got to speak on the phone, to mm. the volume of customers that we serve mm. via the digital channels, mm. it's minuscule. Like we talk, we're talking half a percent. A percent. So the, if you get those journeys right, there's no reason why it won't work. Because again, from my point of view, the only time I will call someone is if I can't do it via web chat or whatsapp or whatever that looks like and then if i get stuck in a loop with a bot that just irritates me if i'm if i've got to wait just as long on web chat than i do on the phone that's irritating as well so it's those little things where if you tie those loops it, it definitely helps when it comes to engaging with customers. And you mentioned earlier around partnering with things like vulnerability, for, for VRS, it is a vulnerability yeah. registration service around using that for segmentation. How much are people willing to give away the fact that they might be vulnerable and how do you find out that through, say, interaction versus using almost like pre-identified? Pre-identified is probably pretty useful in terms of doing that initial segmentation, but how much are people willing to give away that they might be vulnerable or how do you identify that? I think, obviously, again, it's largely down to the customer volunteering a lot of that information. But again, I think from our point of view, we spent a lot of time on, on the branding and the language we use mm. to, to open that door and make a customer feel a little bit more comfortable to talk to us. Yeah. Uh, and that that's the whole resolution, not collection piece. That was the entire premise behind what we were trying to do. We mm. wanted people to feel a lot more comfortable when engaging with us than you would if you think about the corporate traditional look and feel of a debt collection agency mm. we've we're doing a lot of a lot everything we can really to move away from and move away from that and yeah m- make it a little bit more comfortable for people to engage yeah and i suppose was, yeah, it's, it's all around engagement isn't it? about making people feel comfortable how much do you think culture comes around that in terms of like your company culture or in trying to is that an emphasis in trying to push that through that then goes down to the customers as well. Yeah, I think obviously the, there's a lot of, uh, obviously the consumer duty and stuff mm. is going to help with a lot of this in terms of focusing on the outcome. But we were fortunate that we got authorised as the FCA knew this were coming up. Because mm. I remember the meetings we had with the FCA, they were very outcome focused with us anyway. So we kind of hashed a lot of that out with them already. And with 
what we do and how we do things, it were never about payments. It were always about talk to us, engage with us. And that, that, that has been like that since day one. Part of the concern around that has always been us, so you can go back to the days of TCF, is if it's not about payments, it's around engaging with us, does that still revert back in terms of payments? Or, or are we leaving money on the table, I suppose? It's um, the, uh, it's the concern that people kind of voice, I think. Yeah, and that's a concern that we, we talk with clients about, but yeah. we work on panels with other agencies and when we're not underperforming. So I think the focus should be on getting that engagement, having that conversation, and then understanding more about the position that customer's in. And then if that results in payment, then great, but not everyone can pay. But by engaging and understanding about the circumstances, it means that they can be helped. So yeah, the only thing that, the only thing I can really say there is we work alongside other DCAs on panels and the performance isn't lacking. And we've got consumer duty coming up. That's due, due to go live finally at the end of July. It's time's ticking on that and it's getting, the deadlines are getting nearer. What do you think the readiness is in terms of what you've seen? Obviously, you guys are you know, on a, well on the path to getting ready as well. But how do you think that's going to change fundamentally the industry? I think it's a big win for the customer. And I think it's going to, it puts the pressure on firms to, to focus on the outcome more. So that, that whole resolution, not collection piece is a lot more important so yeah i think for a, for a, from a customer point of view it's a big win and it's not going to happen overnight obviously there's a lot to do but yeah i think it's a it's a positive yeah and how are you thinking how are you thinking about evidencing and that's one of the challenges that that i've definitely heard at least from the creditor sector at least anyways is you've got to evidence you give leading to better customer outcomes etc and the measurement of it is can be quite tricky what's been your kind of approach maybe you're in a little bit of an easier place because you're a collections agency and you've got more defined outcomes from a, from from a payment plan point of view yeah kind of things. what's your what's been your kind of approach around the evidencing an MR? well yeah so with us obviously we've got every touch point we store every touch point whether it's a mm. click on an sms log into the portal the buttons are clicking on the portal we also have uh, i don't know if you've heard a hot jar that tracks a user's mm. movements on the so we do customer journey audits as well and it's about identifying those sticking points so just because yeah. a customer got to a, a payment arrangement did they get there as easy as they can was it the journey enough mapped out for them so yeah i think evidencing it from our point of view is a little bit easier because we've got defined outcomes anyway about about what we're trying to do whether that's flat recognize that, that the vulnerable or set up payment plan the payment in full settle the account whatever that looks like we've got that end outcome data but we also have everything in between from every link clicked so we can identify customers easily that that have had longer customer journeys than someone else so so same outcome but twice as long it's about understanding why yeah and i suppose you think we're going to get to the point where we're going to be able to look at maybe even the same outcomes, but different channels and directions to get there. And does it leave us different rates of completion as examples? So for example, it might be length of time on a payment arrangement before breaking, or did it get to completion? Length of time of, a, of an arrangement in total, those kind of things, or payment amount. Do you think different approaches or different channels are going to lead to different outcomes? Have you seen that, for example, with digital versus non-digital? So what I'd say, no, not really. I think what the, it's, via the because a, cust- a customer can if they were halfway through a uh, setting up a payment arrangement for example and they wanted to speak to someone they could start the web chat and then the agent can talk them through how to do it and generate the completed link to send it them so it's almost allowing the customer to to skip that part and the agent will do it and just send a link and then they follow the link and just complete the plan so that we found that when we introduced that that, that that has quite a high success rate. And I think that's the element of they've actually spoke to someone. So yeah, I, and I think we're always looking at the touch points and the date points to, to increase that conversion that conversion rate. And one of the things you mentioned there is around skipping. And I suppose 
some of the conversations I've had have been around attention spans and people's attention span and the attention economy. Yeah. We, we might have talked about that. How much of a reality do you think that is? Because on one hand, you've got engagement and I want to talk with a human, right? And I want yeah. to have that engagement and that's engagement or however you do it, even if it's through a chat. And the other one is I'm pushed for time and I just want to get it done as quick as possible. I mean, where's the sort of balance between the two? Yeah, and again, that's I, that's down to personal preference of, of the customer. You'll you'll yeah. always have you'll always have the customer that that can't be bothered, doesn't want to yeah. do it. So they'll just say, "This is where I'm at, sort it," and yeah. we can do that. But you'll also, on the flip side, you've got, and from our experience, the vast majority of people that that don't want to talk to someone, they'll just be like, yeah. "I can do it myself. I'll just do it, and that's it." But yeah, definitely, the the attention span is. A critical it's got to be a cr- critical thought when you're planning out your digital journeys because people can easily get bored and they will do and you don't want them dropping out if they're halfway through setting a payment plan you don't want them leaving and just staying in a, an unresolved status that, it could almost be like a new segmentation isn't it we might segment it by digital versus non-digital preference but it could actually be by by what's your attention span yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah am i an impatient person who wants to get it done in 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 15 seconds or you know in a couple of minutes versus someone who really wants to have that engagement with someone and feel like they're being looked after i wonder if that's almost like a psychological kind of split from a segment <coughs> And uh, yeah, and I think also that kind of brings in the beauty of a digital chat tool like a text mm. message or a WhatsApp mm. is because you can you could be sorting out a payment plan over a matter of days. Yeah. Because it's not an instant reply yeah. service, but at least they're engaging. So it it might be a back and forth over over two or three days to to get the account under arrangement paid, which is absolutely fine because at the end of the day people have got things to do. The yeah. They might not have time to, to do it themselves or sit on the phone. Yeah. So, yeah, again, that that's something that we've seen is quite popular. Send us a WhatsApp and then we'll get back to you and it, it back and forth like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost like the analogy between, like, on, on YouTube, between short videos. We see these short videos coming up now versus, and they seem to be flooding, flooding my feed versus long videos, right? And, like, yeah. you know, I quite like the long videos, but some a lot of people clearly like the short videos. And it's, there's a balance there. I suppose part of our role is probably just to, to adapt to whatever the customers want. Is that kind of what you think? Yeah. I, and again, I think it's a lot down to preference. So if the, if the options are ready and available, let the customer choose. And that could, that stems down into everything, payment options, the different query options, what, whatever that looks like. If the, if you've got multiple journeys available, mm-hmm. let the customer choose which one is best for them. Yeah. Yeah. And as the topic du jour, uh, I suppose the hot topic of the moment is large language models, chat GTP, and as it links into things like, particularly around, around chat and I suppose and relationships, do you think it can ever go along the way to recreating some of that? Or do you think we've really got to go back to making sure you're talking with someone and that human connection is actually important, even versus what might be quite a convincing, but not a human connection? Yeah, so for me, I've said this quite quite a few times on LinkedIn and stuff that, that I'm not a massive fan of chatbots. I've, I'm not completely switched off to them. It's not a no, never again. It's just a, I've not seen one that's going to service the customers in the way I want them to do, want them to be serviced. It, the, it brings too many knots into the customer journey for me. Yeah. So for us, what works well is the seamless transfer through to an agent yeah. and I also look at things that, that, don't get me wrong, that chat GPT is, is pretty cool. It's mm, very yeah, smart. But then from getting that into, from that into a, a niche subject like debt and debt resolution, it's a million miles away from that, I think. Yeah. So if it could, then I'd consider it because it, it seems pretty, pretty cool. Um, it's almost like it's the controls over it, isn't it, as well? Yeah. Which is, if you're not monitoring every conversation, is just making sure that, particularly when it's a sensitive conversation, that they're saying things that are appropriate. Yeah. And I, I, I always look at this as well, like, how would I react in that scenario? What do I like? What would I like in that scenario? And I know if I want to talk to Santander or NatWest, the, I hate the bots. The first thing I've got to speak to is a bot. It's just the presents a few options. Is it this? No, it's not that. And then you get a few more, and it's no. And it drives me insane. And I'm, for me, that frustrates me. And I'm talking about a 
savings account or something. <laughs> if I were there to talk about debt, which I, I don't want to be there in the first place, I've gone out of my way to, to be there. Now I'm talking to a bot that's not giving me the answers I need and it's stalling me mm. so that it doesn't set the conversation off on the right foot. Yeah. So far, anyway, from what I'm seeing. I'm open-minded, suppose- though. Yeah, and I suppose in terms of trying to get help, more help out to customers, particularly what we've potentially got coming up for us, are there areas where you think we've got to focus? We talked a bit about vulnerabilities. Do you think there are specific areas of vulnerability or areas where, as an industry, we can provide more help or maybe more detail around support that, that sort of needs to be done? And I'm particularly thinking around how do we get ahead of what might be more people coming through in terms of financial difficulties? I think for from our, so our thinking at, at my end, we've got, I don't know if you saw, we got the Dear CEO letter. And in yeah. there, they made reference to presenting more options other than debt advice. So the, and they referenced the debt respite scheme, for example. Mm-hmm. So that, that is becoming a bit more popular. But I think, so the, there's that, that kind of stuff that, that we can ca- incorporate and present as an option outside of just your bog standard speak to pay plan debt advice. And there's also the priority services register as well that I think a lot of these things are potentially great tools, but not that many customers know about them. So I think us, from our side, if we present that information to a customer, again, it's about presenting the information and let them choose what's best for them. So yeah, I think those kind of integrations into strategies and presenting that information will definitely help broaden customer knowledge on what's available. Same with the these the cool benefits calculators we've integrated in Best, for example, yeah. Stuff like that. Just sit outside of, yes, we're a resolution agent, say we've, we've been asked to contact you on behalf of his client, but there is also a lot of tools and information within here that will help you outside of this one specific debt. Yeah. Take a look. It does feel like even some of the other regulators outside of the FCA are starting to make some of the very similar noises. They've made them already, but it seems like that's being... The pressure is being increased to do some of the similar things the FCA has done. I and mean, this is before consumer duty goes in, which is yeah. another level beyond, doesn't yeah, it? So yeah, it feels yeah. like it's, there's quite a lot of alignment that's going on, at least in the UK. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's all. that all stems back to that people are struggling. And it's noticeable across every walk of life that if, you, if your utility bill doubles in, in the space of a few months, then you've got people that that were barely getting through anyway and then the utility bills doubled again and it's it's tough so i think obviously i think from that by displaying that information and making those solutions known definitely help because a lot of people don't know a lot of people don't know about those kind of stuff and i suppose as we sit here today we talk a bit about the changing nature of the volumes that you see how do you feel about the next six months or so is both in terms of I suppose in terms of volumes but also in terms of stress on the customer are you optimistic or you think we might be I mean are we past the worst of it or do you think we're, we've still got more to come I think we've still got a little bit more to come because obviously we're going to have the lag so the same way and you've got the lag in the price cap it, the, from prices going up and down I think you we're going to have that lag in terms of people falling falling behind but then so I think as long as the processes are in place to work with these customers, I think I'm pretty optimistic that it won't, it won't drag on for too long. But I think, yeah, I do think we've got a bit more ahead. Yeah, I think the concern is if we haven't really seen unemployment change, like we were chatting about earlier, yeah. but if unemployment changes, then that creates a very different kind of crisis, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I suppose from an industry point of view, where do you think we go next from here? We talked about vulnerability, we talked about digital, digital servicing, all of those have been quite big topics. What's the, what do you think the, ne- the next kind of area it is? Or do you think it's just really around how do we get through the next sort of six, nine months with economic stress? I think the, the vulnerability piece and proactively identifying vulnerability is going to be the top topic for mm. the next six to nine months at least. Because say we're going to find or we're already seeing that that, that are struggling that, that necessarily wouldn't have been and it's struggling for reasons beyond their control which yeah. kind of gives that extra layer of sympathy of we've got to we've got to go out of his way to, to help these guys so yeah I, th- I think that's definitely i know that's where our focus is and we've done a lot already we've got 
few more things in the pipeline to help with that but yeah that that's where our focus is and will be definitely for the immediate short term six to nine months yeah. and i suppose moving to a bit of a different topic around the collections market and i suppose busyness and those kind of things a lot of people i've been chatting to have been very busy at the start of this year it feels like there's been started start of this year you know been a lot of investment almost like in preparation for what might be coming down the pipe it, it, it feels like this year is very different from the last couple of years and even last year which was the pandemic was tailing off but it wasn't as busy at the start of this year have you seen do you feel the kind of is that a similar kind of yes yeah yeah i could agree with that observation i I think as well on the flip side we're going to be in a position where if the volumes do spike it's going to be more work for Mm. almost fewer payments for example Mm. because these it's all right so i always where friends and family there are oh you work in debt collection you must be rammed and it's yeah but it's a different kind of busy it's not yeah. it's not oh rammed we've got payments flooding in through the door it's yeah. we're speaking to people that that are genuinely struggling so the, it's almost a, 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 i think from a agency point of view i think that'll be the struggle over the especially this year as the payment obviously a lot of agencies work on a commission only model so if you've got increased volume, increased costs, but your payment, your average payment amount smaller, mm. the, there's a bit of a squeeze there. So I think that's where, from an agency point of view, the struggle will come from. And I suppose the digital processes allow you to do that at, at a lower cost to a certain extent, potentially. What about, if you're sitting in a creditor though, what about using digital to try and call people early enough? Do you think, I had a few conversations around whether we're calling people early enough or we're getting out in terms of to avoid detriment, consumer harm, as early as possible and is that sort of are you seeing enough of that going on do you think there's more we can do i'm a little worried about particularly around contingent liability on the balance sheet in terms of like people haven't even gone into collections yet but are already struggling yeah what, what do you think of that i think there i think because again it, it's a tough one because you, you're very reliant on the customer volunteering that information so i think for me what i'd be doing in that position is just making sure customers know what support and help's available and it, 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 it's, I think they were an example of a Barclays one. It said, hey, just so you know, these tools are available. Talk to us, help team here, visit this here. And it's about, it, it's wording in a way that I'm not saying, hey, Chris, I know you might be vulnerable here. Look at this. It's, hey, Chris, the, these are the options available to you. Should you ever need them, they're there. And I think by doing something like that, it definitely, again, it goes somewhere to open that door and make a customer a little bit more likely to engage. It feels like it comes down to that engagement or interpersonal reaction piece as well, which yeah. is trying to engage people or talk to people much much earlier, yeah. having that relationship, I suppose, that, yeah. that they'll come to you for help. Yeah. And, and you've got to think from a point of view, if someone has never fallen behind on, on a loan repayment before, mm-hmm. the first time they do, there's going to be that element of embarrassment. They're going to be like, oh my God, I, I can't believe, I can't believe this. I've never missed a payment. So they're probably a little bit less likely to volunteer. They're the kind of person that that's, that might bury their head in the sand and hope it gets better later down the line. They're probably a little bit less likely to volunteer that information and say, hey, it's the first time this has ever happened to me, but I'm struggling. So making those, a simple email with the different options available saying, hey, if you ever need it, these are the options available to you. Yeah. Makes that a little bit easier for a customer to, to volunteer that information. And you look at things like tone of voice, so it's almost like that reassuring tone versus these are the options tone. Does that kind of thing help as well? Yeah, definitely. And that that's something that, again, we focused on from day one was around the tone of voice, the, the language we use, the way we talk to customers in everything. Because I think... The average, of it, the av- I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's young. The average reading age of the per- of a adult in the UK, it's something like 11. And I think you see some of these debt collection letters and you read them and you think, if I was 11 reading this, what does it mean? Yeah. Pro- nine times out of 10, it means absolutely nothing. Yeah. And it, uh, they just a little bit friendlier, make it a little bit clearer. Use, don't, you don't have to be so formal. And I think that definitely goes some way in, in helping customers, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's all about your brand as well. I think you, I don't want clients or customers to view the digital DRA as a corporate mm. debt resolution agency. I want it to be a little bit friendlier, welcoming, 
and that that's what we've tried doing with it. the name the branding colors the language we use if you go on our customer portal if you read through there and put it side by side to more of a traditional dca you, you can see the difference and that was that were all part of the planning from day one yeah we wanted to move away from that it certainly seems with consumer duty coming up that you've, the stars have aligned to a certain extent in terms of what's being asked for us. And I suppose, yeah, we just have to see how the next sort of few months go economically, don't we? I, yeah. Hopefully we've got to be there to try and give support to people as much as we can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Dan, thanks very much. I, I was marvelling at the start of it, just how, how tidy your kitchen is versus my office. Uh, so, Not always uh, like that, I'm telling you. <laughs> the kids will trash it soon. <laughs> <laughs> but I do appreciate you really joining me today. And uh, yeah, as always, it's great to chat to you. So Yeah, th- thanks, Chris. And we'll, I'm sure we'll catch up soon. Probably bump into you at some event. Yeah, They're all coming up now. Good. Yeah, See you soon. Okay, okay. cheers.